Every marriage is going to go through trials. Trials are going to produce endurance if we learn to work through them. For Cindy and me, our biggest trial was five years of infertility. James writes a fascinating passage. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. I remember the first time I read that passage, I thought, oh, I'm supposed to be happy when trials come. I even had people teach me that. I had a friend in Nacogdoches who was a pastor teach that concept that when a trial comes, smile. And it took me a long time before I understood what James was saying. It's a long sentence. And what he's saying is parenthetically, consider it joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, da, 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 da. Because if you get through it, you're going to learn endurance. In other words, consider it joy, not for the trial. But as you go through it, you're going to learn endurance, and endurance is going to have a result to make you something that you were not able to do before, to help you be equipped to do something that you weren't able to do before. And we've had lots of trials and difficulties in our marriage. Um, I'll own a lot of them. But one that we had together and that we put over here was infertility. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got married, Cindy said she had a wonderful plan for my life. She wanted four children. Two years apart. And so the first time we uh, tried, we conceived and had a beautiful daughter and everything was wonderful. And at the appropriate time, she said, it's time to uh, get pregnant again. So being the dutiful husband, <laughs> I obliged and uh, we went through five years of infertility. And um, there's, a, there's a passage in Genesis 30 where Rachel comes to Jacob and says, give me children else I die. I was... And starting my career, I was young. I had this wonderful, beautiful, precious daughter. I was happy. I didn't need to have four children. But Cindy really wanted to have four children. And so this became probably, at that time at least, one of the biggest challenges we faced. And as you think back on that, how did you process it? How did we process it from your perspective? Well, I think one of the... the first things but this was the first challenge we faced that wasn't between us just adjustments typical adjustments of marriage this was the first problem that we had that was outside of us that we could not control we had zero control over it um, and for me it was so difficult and different from you in that every month I had a grieving cycle I had a hope cycle and then I would grieve again so emotionally I was just all over the place for years, for several years. And, and because you didn't feel what I felt, um, it was, it, there was a, a distance between us, even though you would try and you wanted to support me in, in the pain that I was feeling, you couldn't on that level, and nor should you, nor should I have expected you to. But, um, but that was, that was definitely, I think, the first. It was the first time in my life that I couldn't fix something I was going through. We talk about a lot of difficulties in our marriage. Another one has been uh, my chronic back pain mm -hmm. uh, beginning in 99, 2000-ish, and now four major back surgeries later and an uncertain future. And, you know, all of us are going to have things. You, you don't get married and... You think, oh, uh, what if one of us gets cancer? One of us, you know, you have this plan, and we thought where we'd be at this stage in life was very different than where we are at 57 and counting. And you had some great observations about that recently, about as we face difficulties at this stage, how it's different than when we were early married. Yeah, and I think every difficulty can mean that you are retooling your marriage, that you're changing your expectations. I mean, what we thought that empty nest would look like isn't necessarily what empty nest looks like because of your back pain and your issues and the, the things that places specifically we thought we would travel or, or go or the things that we thought we would be doing, perhaps a more active life, um, is just not attainable. And so... I have to, and you have to also, to adjust our expectations to, because of these difficulties, what will things 
look like. And that does affect how we relate to one another and then to the world around us and what we're going to do. So all of life is adjustment. All of marriage is adjustment as we, as we have things either outside our marriage or inside our marriage come into it. We have to tweak constantly, constantly tweak. And I think we'll be doing that in, until the Lord yeah. calls one of us home. Yeah. We're all going to face difficulties. They come in, in a different form and fashion than we ever expect. Nobody thinks you're going to be infertile or have chronic back issues or cancer when you're 35 or, or, or. We're all going to have them. So, uh, we, we, number one, uh, difficulties don't mean something's wrong. You know, we're fallen people in a fallen context, and that's, that's our lot in life, if you will. So faith is confident assurance of things hoped for, and I always like to say it this way, with a conviction of things not yet seen. That I hope for and I believe in Christ at his word, but I can't always see what that looks like. And that's faith. It's an extraordinary definition the word gives us. Again, as we talk so many times, the problem can't be you know, between Cindy and me or you guys. The problem's over here. You know, this is our difficulty, and uh, I love hearing you guys talk about we're for each other, and just reminding ourselves again and again and again that we've got to be in community. We've got to have other believer, believers that are walking in the same direction. None of them are perfect. You're never going to, if you find that four where you all click, hallelujah, fantastic. It may be for a season. It may be for a lifetime. But even if you don't, you can find certain relationships that will fuel you at different parts. Uh, might be professionals. Might be, oh, by the way, might even be the unbelieving world where someone is really wise and shrewd in decision-making and, and compassion. So see how God's truth comes to different ways. Our, our big hope for, for all of us is that we're, that we're in the Word, that we're uh, studying the Word well and not taking it out of context. And my, my broken drum is, you know, 99% of our problems are solved if we understand the context of the Bible and what that verse and passage mean in its setting, not ripping it out and misapplying it, uh, walking with others, long view, and to know that he loves us. He's not mad at us. He doesn't pace heaven's floor saying, you idiots, you're mucking up your marriage, you know. He's for us. He loves us. He died for us. He demonstrates that over and over and over in his word that if we were the only, we say, if we're the only ones on the planet, he would still die for us. That that's how much he loves us. Um, that the spirit indwells us and we live impoverished spiritually, but we have God's word, God's spirit, and God's people. And if, if you do that for the long haul, you will be successful, not the way the world defines it, but in a spiritual realm that you can smile at the future, that you can have a dis disability of chronic back issues that have an uncertain future, but this woman's for me. And I feel less a man because of that. I know she's for me. That you can have breast cancer when you're 38, and it's going to change you huge ways, but your husband's for you and Christ is for you. And it, it's simple, but the world screams that it's bad theology. So don't let the world teach the theology. And always keep it in context and always keep those people close by. God's word, God's spirit, and God's people.